The European Reformation Movement aimed to reorganize into distinct national churches under state control the ecclesiastical resources, properties and inheritance belonging to the medieval Catholic Church. One of these national churches was the Church of Ireland, but it was initially seen as part of a united Church of England and Ireland. This reflected Ireland's subordinate position within the wider Tudor state, which also included England and Wales, and its dynamic remained largely English. In its arrested development, the Church of Ireland remained one of the Reformation's least successful national churches. Studies of the Irish Reformation have understandably focused on the reasons for failure. Why the Reformation failed in Ireland has been the subject of a protracted debate amongst historians over the past 40 years. Various often conflicting explanations have been offered. In part, the character of the debate reflects the scrappiness of the evidence, especially for Elizabeth's reign, which was widely seen as crucial to the overall outcome to reform. As the um, Irish Reformation historian Henry Jeffreys argues in his fine recent survey, the authorities finally succeeded from 1560 in establishing a stable religious settlement after many short-lived changes, experiments and reverses in reform since the 1530s. For the state of the church on the eve of Tudor reform, we have quite extensive evidence and also for reform's initial impact in the parishes, at least for the main areas of English influence around the English Pale and the Southeast. We have a full set of Episcopal registers of the Archbishop of Armagh to 1558, for instance. But evidence about the Elizabethan settlement, its introduction and enforcement, is certainly thinner. Mostly state paper reports and ex parte claims about clerical shortcomings and church failings, and no Armagh registers. For Tudor England, Episcopal registers and church wardens' accounts are a major source for the progress of reform, but these are lacking for Ireland. So what we get are conflicting claims based on state paper accounts and reports about the reasons for failure. In assessing the importance of the competing claims in this debate for the failure of reform, I want to use Tudor Galway as a case study. This seaport town lay at the furthest remove from the centre of English influence around Dublin. It was an isolated English parish in a largely Gaelic region on Ireland's west coast, and so a most unlikely centre for reform in the parishes. As ostensibly suggested by the meagre surviving evidence for the impact of reform on Tudor Galway, failure was utterly predictable. But by squeezing a bit more from thin and scrappy sources, a sketch can be drawn of a quite successful reform movement. And this has implications for Tudor reform elsewhere. Those aspects of reform which succeeded in Galway point to their relative importance in the wider scheme, which, according to the debate, were the main reasons for failure elsewhere. And aspects of, re of reform which also failed in Galway, despite reform's overall success there, were clearly less important among reasons for failure overall. So weighing specific reasons for success or failure in Galway points to their relative importance among reasons suggested for failure overall. Given the Reformation's comparative success in Tudor England, these tried and tested strategies for reform should be a starting point for understanding why reform did not produce a similar result in Tudor Ireland. The question is addressed directly in a paper by Henry Jeffreys in 2016 in Irish History's leading academic journal. The publishers of Irish Historical Studies claim this article is presently their most read paper, which is a surprise given the greater level of public interest in modern Ireland. Among the reasons identified by Jeffreys for failure was that from the start, with the restoration in 1560 of the Book of Common Prayer, BCP for, uh, for the future, there was 
general non-attendance at Protestant services. Queen Elizabeth was also told in 1564 that Ireland then had only three Protestant preachers, two bishops, including Adam Loftus, Archbishop of Armagh, and a vicar. The ongoing paucity of preachers here reflected the severe shortage of graduate clergy. Ireland had no university until 1592, but on all three counts, Galway did better than most other parts of Tudor Ireland. Ecclesiastically, Tudor Galway was dominated by St Nicholas Collegiate Church, well staffed by a warden and eight vicars appointed by the town's mayor and corporation. The vicars also served chapels in surrounding Irish-speaking districts just outside the town. The major steps in the Irish Reformation followed broadly along English lines, albeit with some delay, but little evidence survives for Galway about the earliest phase of Tudor reform. The characteristically Anglican contribution to reform, the Royal Supremacy, was enacted by the Irish Reformation Parliament in 1536. A campaign for the dissolution of the monasteries soon followed, although probably not reaching Galway until later. This confiscation of church property was also extended to parish churches with a campaign against abused images. Liturgically, Latin began to be replaced by English in church services, with the common prayers in English, the English Bible, and the requirement for gospel-based sermons in every church at least once a quarter. From 1536 onwards, successive articles of religion also provided official doctrinal statements, largely traditional until 1553, about what priests and people should believe. Until 1549 and the introduction of the first English prayer book, the BCP, reform in the parishes produced few visible signs of change. But crucially, in 1549, the Latin Mass was finally replaced by an English communion service. But in Ireland, the new BCP was only fitfully introduced, one excuse being a shortage of copies. This scarcity was re rectified in 1551 by establishing the first press in Ireland to print copies of the BCP. And then in 1553, the Protestant religious settlement introduced under Edward VI abruptly collapsed with the King's early death and Mary's Catholic re reaction. Mary's reign proved even shorter though, and after her accession, Queen Elizabeth quickly restored the royal supremacy and King Edward's Protestant religious settlement. But in Ireland, the Elizabethan settlement was again delayed, pending Elizabeth's first Irish Parliament, which in 1560 passed parallel, parallel acts of supremacy and uniformity. And with a stable religious settlement finally enacted, the task could begin of enforcing reform in the parishes. How much of Tudor reform's early phases was introduced in Galway is unclear. The first major change probably came when Lord Deputy Grey visited Galway in July 1538. He had the mayor and corporation sworn to the royal supremacy and to refuse the usurped power of the Bishop of Rome, commanding the mayor to have the commons likewise sworn and to certify this into chancery. Grey then swore the bishop, Christopher Bodkin, Archbishop of, of Tuam, commanding him likewise to swear and certify his clergy. During his week-long visit, Gray also confiscated images and ornaments from the collegiate church, which were uh, uh, ornaments allegedly subject to popular abuse. And fearing further spoliation, the church wardens made an agreement in 1546 with James Lynch, merchant of Galway, who received the jewels of the church, a great silver cross, four silver candlesticks, four silver chalices, and a pyx for the sacrament, in return for 60 pounds sterling spent by him on candlesticks, a lectern of brass, 
which was probably for the New English Bible, and glass, lead and bricks for church repairs. In 1551, Lord Deputy St Ledger reported that the King's Chancellor, visiting Galway and Limerick, had established the King's Majesty's orders for religion, notably the use of the English prayer book, with great assurance the same shall be duly observed. Also in 1551, the Collegiate Church received confirmation of its privileges by royal charter from King Edward VI, the Supreme Head, being restyled the King's College of Galway under its warden and vicars, with a grant of dissolved monasteries. Patrick Blake, merchant and priest, was made College Warden, with eight more clergy appointed vicars choral, half of them native Irish. Elsewhere, the, re the reformers drive for a cheap church seriously undermined traditional sources of church funding, but initially this was less true of Galway. Despite the Catholics' jibe that this was not a reformation but a defamation of the church, the parish largely avoided the spoliation of church property which characterised early Tudor reform elsewhere, but, but perhaps more because the increase of true, true religion had so far been fitful and sporadic. Even so, a stable settlement of religion still took time to enforce consistently in Reformation Galway. Protestantism involved a radically different, bibliocentric presentation of Christianity in place of the pre-Reformation church's more visual focus and traditional ceremonies. Sacred space also needed an adaptation to accommodate the religion of the word. In 1560, out went mass in Latin, said or sung by the priest to part in the chancel, separated by a rood screen from the congregation in the nave, standing and watching as passive observers. In came prayer book services in English, with communal worship by priests and people together. The laity were now expected to understand and participate in the service. But in Galway, the church authorities aimed to mitigate the more radical changes to retain popular support. If the Elizabethan settlement had been suddenly introduced overnight and rigidly enforced, resistance to reform would probably have built up quickly. Through Elizabeth's early years, many conservative merchants and gentry continued to worship in their parish churches despite an evident distaste for prayer book services. Later, they are opted for recusancy, abandoning parish churches built up from endowments by their ancestors, frequenting instead illegal mass houses. But in some poor towns, strong church attendance continued and an enthusiastic Protestant minority sometimes emerged. This was certainly the case in Elizabethan Galway, where high levels of church attendance were maintained throughout the reign. The reformers' success here reflected the collegiate church's favourable balance of clergy and the quality of clerical leadership, but also efforts to preserve some continuity initially with pre-Reformation practice, partly by exploiting poorly understood provisions of the Elizabethan settlement. The settlement enacted in 1560 included two special provisions modifying normal reform practice, which are very relevant to Galway. First, in churches where the minister could not speak English, instead of using the BCP, he could use a Latin translation, the Liber Frecum Publicarum. In practice, the Liber largely followed the old Catholic liturgy. Formerly, it was a Latin translation of the BCP, but the English prayer book was in turn largely a translation of the old Catholic Latin, but revised on specific points in line with Reformed doctrine. So instead of translating afresh into Latin, the Liber mostly followed verbatim the old Latin liturgy, or occasionally a Latin translation of the first English prayer book. Second, the Elizabethan injunctions, a series of orders clarifying the settlement, allowed a modest and distinct song 
in all parts of the common prayers, provided it may be as plainly understood as if it were read without singing. Also, for comforting of such that delight in music, there may be sung an hymn or such like song at the start or end of the service, in the best sort of melody and music that may be conven conveniently devised, having respect that the sentence of the hymn may be understood. This clause of the injunction was particularly aimed at cathedrals and collegiate churches. Tudor reform had retained these choral foundations with pipe organs and a large staff of clergy as vicars choral, and this had no parallel elsewhere in Protestant Europe. The injunctions thus ensured a continuing role for the collegiate church's choristers, organ and bells. In 1561, Mayor Lynch donated an organ and a great bell. A belfry in the tower followed in 1590 with a new chime of bells summoning the town for communal worship, perhaps still to toll a solemn funeral knell and alerting the townsmen in case of a possible attack. Directly after the Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity passed in 1560, the oath of supremacy was tendered to three bishops. The bishops of Meath and Kildare refused it and were deprived. But Christopher Bodkin, Archbishop of Tuam, a native of Galway, was among the few senior clergy who took the oath properly in 1560. The warden, Patrick Blake, failed to appear when summoned before the Queen's Commissioner, was arrested by the mayor, and finally took the oath before the Archbishop of, Ar of Armagh and the commissioners in 1563. But Blake had been warden under Edward VI and was replaced under Mary by Clement Skerritt, who was still warden in 1561. So probably Blake recovered the wardenship after Skerritt was deprived for refusing the oath of supremacy. By 1563, Bodkin and Blake, though hardly enthusiastic Protestants, were probably reliable enough to establish minimal conformity in Galway. In 1567, the Lord Deputy, Sir Henry Sidney, visited Galway. His brief report included acute observations on the state of religion there and the church's choral tradition. The mayor and alderman first received him and then he went onto the church and in the churchyard, Archbishop Bodkin received him in his pontificals, accompanied with diverse priests and clerks in copes singing. Sidney's comments on clerical vestments referred to the vestiarian controversy then raging in England. Archbishop Parker had clarified in 1566 that bishops should wear accustomed apparel, uh, uh, accustomed ap uh, apparel and a communion in collegiate churches and cathedrals, the celebrant and two assistants should wear copes as here, but in lesser churches only a comely surplus uh, with sleeves. Bodkin was one of the few Elizabethan bishops surviving from the 1530s and retained traditional Episcopal vestments by invoking the BCP's ambiguous ornaments rubric. Sydney then visited the Church of Our Lady outside Galway, remaining until Te Deum Laudamus was sung in Latin, and after prayers he went to his lodging. The Act of Uniformity 1560 permitted the Latin officers here Matins with Te Deum Laudamus using the Liber Precum Publicarum. But what Sydney encountered in Galway was hardly what the Elizabethan settlement had really intended. In England, the clergy's daily obligation to say Matins and Evensong publicly had first been ordered in 1552, requiring the curate to toll a bell thereto a convenient time before he begin, that such as be disposed may come to hear God's word and to pray with him. The order was not then authorised in Ireland, but it was included in 1560 in, in the BCP. The following Sunday, 
Sydney attended the collegiate church for morning service. This was presumably in English. Sydney would have remarked had he been in Latin as he did the morning he arrived. He was much impressed though by a very godly sermon preached by a priest of Ireland which was some time a friar. He made his preface in Latin and after delivered unto the Lord Deputy he declared in English a very godly les lesson to the comfort of a great number that heard. The sermon ended, the Lord Deputy called for the said preacher in thanking him for his good sermon. The preacher was probably Roland Lynch, later Bishop of Kilmacduff, and raised by Francis Martin, Galway's Protestant mainstay and merchant. Sidney's report implied that Lynch led what soon became the usual sudden, uh, Sunday service of morning prayer, la, uh, litany and anti-communion as one continuous rite. If it had been communion, a lynch would have been immediately available to Sydney after his sermon. Now I need here to look at how prayer book service has developed in Galway to explain this continuous rite, though this is very conjectural. Liturgically, the Book of Common Prayer's poetic language set new standards for worship, but initially congregations ev almost everywhere disliked the change from familiar Latin to unfamiliar English. When the prayer book first came in, in 1549, the, refor the reformers' expectation was that lay people should receive communion regularly in both kinds on Sundays and holy days. Before the Reformation, by contrast, they'd mostly been passive observers as the priests celebrated Sunday Mass, and they went to confession and received communion only once a year at Easter. In 1549, the new English communion service included an order that those intending to receive should inform the curate before the beginning of Matins or immediately after. Congregations were expected to attend both Matins and communion on Sundays. And the same arrangements applied in 1560, uh, uh, except that the new English litany or intercessions, which in 1549 had followed the communion, was now placed earlier after Matins to be used on Sundays, Wednesdays and Fridays. The communion then proceeded to the creed, the sermon and the offertory. And by an order in 1549, those intending to receive communion shall tarry still in the choir. After consecration, making a general confession with absolution from the priest before receiving. Those that mind not to receive shall depart after the choir. Later prayer book revisions largely retain these arrangements, except that confession and absolution now preceded the con consecration. But by then, the authorities had also noted the laity's marked reluctance to regular communion. So for non-communicants, at the start of Matins, a penitence was introduced, that is scripture sentences, exhortation, general confession and absolution. So consolidating what was formerly a separate service, but in practice, the first part of a continuous rite on Sundays. And this revised introduction to Matins was in Ireland used from 1560. Another order allowed only the priest to celebrate, uh, only allowed the priest to celebrate communion if a good number wished to communicate. Otherwise, the priest should continue to the sermon, a truncated version of a communion service called the anti-communion, concluding with one or two colleagues and a blessing. So in Reformation Galway, a continuous rite of Matins, Litany and Anti-Communion replaced Mass as principal Sunday service, with Communion only celebrated two or three times a year. As the high point of Sunday services, the godly sermon replaced the miracle of the Mass. This change in worship impacted chiefly on the clergy, but made little difference to the laity who were accustomed to annual Easter communion in one kind before the Reformation. 
but were still very reluctant after the Reformation to accept regular communion. So communion services were usually re reduced to the anti-communion. When the English communion was first introduced in 1549, conservative priests had attempted to mumble their mumpsimus, that is, to counterfeit the mass by saying the service sotto voce as if mumbling the Latin mass. The, this, the service's liturgical structure was the same as the Latin mass, so all the priests needed to do was to restore the now forbidden priestly gestures, notably elevating the host at consecration, and it looked and sounded like mass. Prayerbrook revisions restructured the communion to prevent this, breaking the long Eucharistic canon into separate parts. But in Galway, counterfeiting the Mass was more convincingly achieved by mumbling the Liber Precum Publicarum in Latin. For the laity, liturgical language best distinguished a Catholic Mass from a Protestant communion. Mass in Latin, uh, communion in English. For reformers, the priority was graduate preaching ministers, though, not dumb dogs to minister the sacrament. But expectations of a learned ministry also made it more difficult for the church to make best use of traditionally tra trained clergy. Preaching required a license from the bishop, and that was normally only granted to those with a university degree. And until Trinity's College foundation in 1592, uh, the Church of Ireland had very few graduate preaching ministers because no university, particularly so in the West. Most clergy, neither licensed to preach nor in the latest absence to celebrate communion, were reduced to reading ministers, saying the common prayers and reading stock sermons on Sunday from the Book of Homilies, which replaced the sermon. This matched Elizabeth's expectations of her clergy, chiefly ministers who can read the scriptures and homilies well unto the people, but not to preach. In Galway, though, the vicar's choral continued the daily singing of the officers, and this choral tradition remained an attractive feature initially reinforcing the impression of continuity with the pre-Reformation church. Elsewhere, parish churches heard very little music after the Reformation, beyond congregationally sung metrical psalms in English. Elizabeth's injunctions permitted common prayers in a modest and distinct song, but Reformation style, that is, for every syllable a note. This continued singing, led by eight vicars choral, is also confirmed by a reference in the 1580s to four poor boys supported as choristers by the church. Yet the 1560 Act permitting the Liber Precum Publicarum probably meant that initially the choir continued to sing the Latin offices daily. Traditional musical settings were the only ones available, Catholic ones although settings in English, the Book of Common Prayer, were later on provided, uh, by Talis, for instance, in the 1570s. As principal Sunday service, the continuous rite of Matins, Litany and Anti-Communion probably lasted over two hours, but offered great scope for Gal Galway's oral tradition, including hymns or anthems at the start or close, one or two canticles, and two or three psalms, for which Miles Coverdale's translation of the Psalter became very popular in England. By 1615, however, the Vicar's Choral had been reduced to five, four of whom were Irish, and also Vicar's Choral of Tuam Cathedral. In 1569, Tudor government across the province was strengthened by a new presidency of Connacht under Lord President Edward Fitton, with a council including Archbishop Bodkin and Roland de Borgo, Bishop of Clonfert, both on the Connacht Ecclesiastical Commission as well. They began 
by touring the province to check for religious conformity, finding both clergy and people very cold in religion and too much inclined to superstition. They visited sundry and many of their idols and images in their churches and committed them to the fire, reforming the Church of Galway in particular in sundry other necessary articles according to the Queen's injunctions. For the next five years, President Fitton resided in Galway, ensuring enforcement of the injunctions there, with regular sermons at least monthly, or in default, readings from the Book of uh, Homilies. Also provision of an English Bible, and for removal of shrines, paintings and monuments, of feigned miracles, pilgrimages, idolatry and superstition. But in the collegiate church, some decorative carvings attached to walls, pillars and tombs still survive, including in the south transept, a wall tomb with a crowned figure of Christ with five wounds, uh, now partly defaced, an altar tomb with the carving of an angel, also defaced, and an angel high in the archway between the south aisle and south transept, now the only one to survive unscathed. The statue's preservation suggests a continuing tolerance of belief in the cult of the saints and prayers for the dead, despite Tudor reform. Through the Reformation, the town continued to finance major building projects to enlarge the church, suggesting that reform had not greatly inhibited church funding or endowment. These uh, enlargements included widening both the north and south aisles, extending the south transept, and building the chapel of the Blessed Sacrament between 1538 and 1561, just as theological change ended reserving the sacrament. By 1576, when Lord Deputy Sidney again visited Galway, a more consistent effort was made to increase true religion uh, with regular sermons. Sidney was again impressed by the sermon, the highlight of the service, given in English, Irish and Latin, wonderful academic uh, uh, thrust there, by a countryman of their own called Lynch. This was John Lynch, newly appointed warden, who after reading John Calvin's Institutes, had become a reformed man, a good divine and preacher. Elizabeth later appointed him Bishop of Elphin for his sufficiency, endeavour and travail in preaching. In 1578, she also augmented the college's income to £80 a year, so that the warden and vicars may, might better continue together, maintaining a godly a learned preacher. Across Tuam province, Galway was one of the few benefices rich enough to meet the £30 a year to attract a graduate preaching minister, besides the Archbishop himself and the Bishop of Elphin, they were really the only other two. Few other livings were worth even £10 a year, so Galway was one of the few towns with regular Sunday sermons, plus daily common prayers sung by the vicar's choral. Regular sermons were one of the most more popular innovations of prayer book worship and an evident reason for the full attendance at Sunday services in Galway. But graduate preaching ministers were a rarity among Church of Ireland clergy. In most churches, readings from the Book of Homilies were a poor substitute for the Sunday sermon. In the early 1570s, when President Fitton resided in Galway, the mayor, his brethren, and many of the town, both men and women, more orderly repaired to church than any town in Ireland. After Fitton's departure, the people continued their said going to church by the means of one Walton, another preaching minister dwelling in Galway. Regular church going was also key to advancing reform amongst Galway's youth. In 1574, the Jesuit missionary, Father David Wolfe, 
ruefully reported that 15 young men had accepted reform in, Go in Galway. And in 1577, another hostile source thought that in Galway dwell the greatest heretics of that kingdom. These reports hardly square with historians' claim of a, a mere six local Protestants in the early Elizabethan Church of Ireland, or just 40 Irish-born Christians in 1585. The advance of reform in Galway and the impact on the youth of godly sermons each Sunday probably also explains the exceptional numbers of Galway-born clergy advanced by the Queen to bishoprics in the West. Besides Archbishop Bodkin and Warden Lynch, they included Bishop Stephen Kerwin of Kilmacua and then Clonfert, Kerwin's successor, the Cambridge-educated Bishop Roland Lynch of Kilmacdua and Clonfert, a right religious man for sincere profession and private life, but he wanteth courage freely to preach the word. And then Nehemiah Donnellan, Archbishop of Tuam, notable for preparing the Irish New Testament. These Galway-born bishops were all clearly Protestant and established Tudor Galway's reputation as the paradise of Ireland in number and zeal of professors of the, of the gospel. This did not mean, though, that Tudor reform went uncontested in Galway. An inquisition about the town's religious conformity in 1585 suggests that the mayor and corporation were mostly reliable in religion. Following the mayor's proclamation against inhabitants suspected to abstain them from church to hear God's divine service according to Her Majesty's proceedings, the church clerk and sexton noted defaulters' names. The inquest ordered that all those who have been in town neglecting their due to God and the prince be deeply fined by Mr. Mayor, the clerk and sexton to deliver up their names. But as to whether in this corporation any do use any other service prohibited by God and Her Majesty's laws, they did not know. Possibly the continued use of Latin liturgies with the Liber Precum Publicarum created the impression of a mass illicitly restored. The Liber's communion rite began with a slightly adapted version of the Serum Missal's opening collect for purity, now the distinctive opening prayer of an Anglican Eucharist. But in 1585, an uneducated laity would probably have identified this collect in Latin as the start of Catholic Mass. Even so, the warden and clergy were ordered to use only God's divine service daily according to Her Majesty's injunction and to their minister sacraments and sacramentals accordingly. The order suggests that the English prayer book with daily offices was in normal use. President Bingham reported in 1586 that Galway's inhabitants were mostly well affected in religion already and more given to embrace the gospel than any people in Ireland. But another indication of the pressures now facing the warden and vicars was their resort to law to protect traditional sources of income now being withheld. In 1596 they petitioned the Mayor and Corporation for recovery of 23 items, tithes, offerings, dirges for commemorative masses and two vicarages. By 1590, Tudor Gore was under growing pressure from the Counter-Reformation. Sir Turlough O'Brien lamented the great declination of Galway, now exceedingly fallen away from their former zeal concerning the gospel, through negligence of the magistrates and Romish flattery. Without a preaching minister, services in the collegiate church were less attractive. In 1586, Galway's leading Protestant merchant, Francis Martin, had asked the president to write in favour of Roland Lynch, Cambridge student of divinity. If Galway had a good preacher being so 
well bent already, it would come in short time to very good perfection, both in town and country. But Lynch was in 1587 appointed Bishop of Kilmacduagh. O'Brien claimed in 1590 that where heretofore there was no exception for all sorts and sects to repair to the church, now very few of their men, and not of the chiefest, will be seen to frequent the services. This report implies a full attendance at services for 30 years, but recently only women and youth, uh, not leading merchants, though a few were included on the Connacht uh, Ecclesiastical Commission. By 1596, rebellion and the Nine Years' War were widespread across Connacht. An English garrison was deployed at the uh, mayor's request to defend the town, but Gower's leading men were reluctant to identify closely with the state. Some aldermen uh, later certified uh, in the garrison's favour, including Marcus Lynch, a Protestant and one especially liked of by the state. In 1601, the mayor was described as a Protestant in show, but married to one of Galway's chief requisites. One Sunday morning in 1595, the Bishop of Kilmacduagh preached before, uh, before the congregation, both in English and Irish, before uh, Lord Deputy Russell and the council. Russell's chaplain, Mr. Graves, likewise preached that afternoon and again the following Sunday morning, prompting the mayor to request Russell's assistance for establishing a preacher for the town. In response, Galway received the services of William Daniel, probably Tudor Galway's most gifted divine lecturer and preacher, and amongst the first scholars and then fellow of Trinity College Dublin. In 1596, he resigned his fellowship to come to Galway, telling Lord Burley how he spent his time most painfully in instructing this people, both in the English and Irish tongue, with great hope to prosper, although less appreciated, was his rooting out of their famous idols. Daniel remained until 1601, returning then to Dublin to steer through the press, the Irish New Testament, then the Irish Prayer Book, before becoming Archbishop of Tuam in 1609. He was briefly succeeded by his own student, Abel Walsh, graduate preaching minister, who left Galway in 1602, and that Daniel and Walsh had some impact in Tudor Galway is suggested by Eugene Barnard, Jesuit seminary, who on reaching Galway in 1606 reported that the most famous of the heretical preachers of this kingdom had induced many to, to attend their meetings and services, winning over some native priests who allowed themselves first to communicate with, and afterwards to be deceived by the heretics, saying that they could enjoy their benefices and say mass. So, what were the reasons for successful reform in Tudor Galway, and how did they compare with the stated reasons for failure elsewhere? By matching reasons for success in Galway with stated reasons advanced in the Irish Reformation debate for failure elsewhere, we may classify their relative importance to the wider picture. Basic to success in Galway was continued full attendance at church services under Elizabeth, despite Tudor reform's slow start earlier. Elsewhere, attendance had mostly fallen off by the 1570s as churchgoers opted for recusancy even in English parts where Tudor reform had more chance of success. Church attendance in Galway was encouraged by a mixture of stick and carrot. Progress as by the governor checked religious conformity. After the Connacht presidency was established in 1569, Fitton initially resided there. Leading councillors, bishops, and from 1597, the, town's, the town corporation's more reliable members were included on the ecclesiastical commission. The mayor enforced the recusancy legislation 
1585, fining absentees from church. But enforced attendance did not always win hearts and minds. By 1580, relig uh, religious opinion was increasingly polarized. Compulsion could no longer make Protestants of obdurate papists. Earlier, the broad middle ground between opposing confessions left so-called church papists open to conversion through continued church attendance. Regular sermons by graduate clergy spearheaded this campaign, but when the collegiate church lacked a preaching minister, attendance also fell off. Committed Protestant youths raised on prayer book services emerged early in Galway's Reformation paradise, some later becoming bishops in its rural hinterland. It's argued that Protestantism emerged early in England and Scotland through seaports there trading with the Reformation's German-speaking heartlands or university students studying North, Northern Europe, but that the Irish trade with Northern Europe was limited and indirect. Yet the dynamic of reform in Tudor Galway, also a seaport, but trading with Catholic Spain, differed markedly from that elsewhere. Even without a university, graduate ministers were recruited for wealthy benefices, and enough locally born bishops were found to allay complaints elsewhere about the Church of Ireland's increasingly colonial new English leadership. In Galway, the authorities also retained local support by soft-peddling more controversial aspects of reform. Little was done too to remodel sacred space along Protestant lines. The collegiate church's furnishings and the scenic apparatus of divine worship still remains a fascinating mix of Catholic and reformed, the Catholic eye balancing the Protestant ear in the chapel of uh, Christ with the crusader tomb in the south transept and the North Isles chapel of the blessed sacrament and decorative carvings on walls, pillars and tombs. The Liber Precum Publicarum maintained continuity with pre-Reformation choral traditions, with daily sing uh, singing of the Latin officer. English prayer book services were more problematic in a mainly Irish speaking region, but in England congregations found psalm singing a popular innovation and Galway's normal Sunday service included great scope for psalm singing. To judge from sermons, the replacement of Catholic Latin by Protestant English was also balanced by use of Irish, especially around 1600 when Warden Daniel was preparing his Irish New Testament and Book of Common Prayer. Of course, one swallow does not make a summer, but it's possible to see how, if Tudor reform had been introduced more sensitively and been consistently enforced, as it was in Galway, the outcome might well have been very different. Thank you.